The Pokemon series is no stranger to remakes, and once again we find ourselves awaiting another after the long-awaited announcement of the Diamond and Pearl remakes. If you're familiar with my videos, you'll probably remember that Pokemon Platinum is my favorite entry in the series. You would think that, because of that, I would be excited at the prospect of Diamond and Pearl remakes, but that's not the case. Given Game Freak's recent history with remakes, I'm approaching the announcement with caution. Because they are fewer in quantity and have titles to directly compare themselves to, the Pokemon remakes are perhaps the easiest way to demonstrate the change in mentality Game Freak has had over the years and explain why I'm cautious about another remake. Since I have full videos analyzing these games in detail, I'm focusing on what these remakes bring to the table over the original games. What they improve upon, what they fail to improve upon, and in some cases, what they take away. Let's take it from the top with the first set of games which remade Pokemon Red and Blue, Pokemon Fire Red, and Leaf Green. Fire Red and Leaf Green are two generations removed from the original games and implement almost every new mechanic featured in the Generation 3 games. The special stat split, darkened steel types, abilities, held items, expanded move selection, everything but the day and night cycle is present. And to accommodate for the increased variety you have at your disposal, major encounters have also been given access to new tools to present you with a level of difficulty on par with the original titles. The world has also been fleshed out a bit more than it was originally, on top of the visual presentation being updated to show off the capabilities of the Game Boy Advance, a few areas on the map have been very slightly expanded or changed to include more hidden items, most notably Mount Moon and Rock Tunnel. There's also a brand new post-game area in the Sevi Islands, an archipelago that's home to a brief story sequence linking the events of Red and Blue to the events of Gold and Silver, as well as a large number of Pokémon from Generation 2. There's also the Trainer Tower, the predecessor to Emerald's Trainer Hill, and the Fame Checker, a device which keeps track of things you learn about NPCs in the game that has yet to see a reappearance. They're also the only games in the series to implement a feature that tells you what you did when you last played the game. It was brought back in a half-hearted manner in Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum, but hasn't been seen since. A shame, since a feature like that is useful to facilitate returning to a game after shelving it for a long time. Fire Red and Leaf Green do have a few shortcomings, however. The most major one is in regard to its Pokédex. You're limited to only the original 151 Pokémon and cannot freely trade with other games until the end of the postgame. A strange scenario is created in which Pokémon that you could normally evolve, like Golbat, will stop evolving for no reason. Pokémon variety suffers a bit as a result of these limitations, though since the game sticks so closely to the original game's structure, this isn't a huge issue. A bigger issue is that Trainer Tower is the only repeatable post-game content, and while it does scale to your level, you only get rewarded for completing it once per mode. Even so, Fire Red and Leaf Green are excellent remakes of the original games that fix their shortcomings by bringing them up to modern standards without compromising what made the games great to begin with, as well as add on a significant amount of additional content to make this the definitive way to experience Pokemon Red and Blue. With newfound experience at remakes, Game Freak gave us another set of remakes five years later with Heart Gold and Soul Silver. Like Fire Red and Leaf Green, these games implement every mechanic featured in the Generation 4 games and use the DS's 3D capabilities to give added depth to Johto's overworld. Almost every area has been expanded upon in some way with additional secrets to find, and although some places like Union Cave have been shuffled around a bit, everything from the original games is intact here. The expansion also applies to the Pokédex. Gone are any restrictions on trading, and Pokémon that got evolutions in Gen 4 are free to evolve without a problem. Speaking of Pokémon, one of the biggest changes HeartGold and SoulSilver make are the addition of following Pokémon, a much-beloved feature that lets your Pokémon follow behind you in the overworld. It's mostly an aesthetic thing, but is a wonderful flavor touch that's unfortunately rarely implemented again. Heart Gold and Soul Silver also implement the changes Crystal made to the originals. Yusin and Suicune are encountered throughout your journey, and Platinum's Battle Frontier has also been added to the game. 
Comparing these to the last remakes, there's an incredible amount of new places to go and things to do. Two new routes leading to a new safari zone that's customizable, allowing you to catch Pokemon outside of the Johto decks, Many dungeons that were truncated in the original games like Diglett's Cave and Victory Road have been expanded upon. Dungeons that were cut like the Seafoam Islands and Cerulean Cave have been reintroduced with new layouts. And Mount Silver has been made into an actual dungeon. There's also Voltorb Flip, a cross between Picross and Minesweeper, replacing the slot machines from the original games. And a brand new collection of minigames at the Pokeathlon that are pretty enjoyable on their own and reward you with points to spend on useful items. Unfortunately, not everything has been improved upon. There are more frequent interruptions throughout the story than last time. The catching tutorial has been made mandatory, and there's a new, underdeveloped plotline surrounding the Kimono Girl summoning Lugia or Ho-Oh that can't be ignored. The worst thing about Heart Gold and Soul Silver, however, is their failure to address the level curve problem from the original games. Like Fire Red and Leaf Green, they take advantage of mechanical advancements made throughout the series to improve Gym Leader matches, but the player is still just as likely to be underleveled by the time they reach the Elite Four as they are in the originals. In the scheme of things, though, the new additions and positive changes greatly outweigh the negatives, creating the definitive way to experience Johto and a game many people hold as their favorite in the franchise, with very good reason. Fast forward two generations and we have Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, bringing the Generation 3 titles up to the standards of the Generation 6 games. These titles are mostly faithful to the original Ruby and Sapphire. In some ways they're faithful to a fault, and in others they aren't faithful enough. It will be difficult to reconcile Emerald's storyline changes into the original plots, so the decision to stick with the original plotline is understandable. And the additional character depth given to the villainous teams this time are appreciated. What is less appreciated is that the storyline is more intrusive, stopping you more frequently to give you tutorials and moments with plot-important characters. It's not on the level of X, Y, or any future installments, but it's still irritating nonetheless. Less understandable still is the decision to simplify or remove parts of the game. The game corner's complete removal and the removal of the Safari game makes sense, as they weren't particularly loved to begin with, but less understandable is some dungeons being cut down. Granite Cave, New Mauville, Mount Pyre, Sky Pillar, and even Victory Road have been simplified. And although other areas remain intact and the Scorched Slab has been turned into a real dungeon, if a small one, the removal of areas instead of additions is a troubling shift. More troubling is the difficulty balancing or lack thereof. X and Y's experience share returns here with the same issues. Compounded by the addition of Mega Evolution, the player being given a free Latios or Latias halfway through the game, and the original Gym Leader roster is being used instead of the improved Emerald lineups, most evident when facing Tate and Liza, who only have two Pokémon. There have been some new additions. Along with the Scorched Slab mentioned earlier, Soaring is introduced after the main conflict is resolved, allowing the player to fly to spots throughout the region where legendary Pokémon and Pokémon from outside the Hoenn decks can be found. There's also the Delta episode, which is unfortunately the worst post-game storyline in a Pokemon game by a large margin. It's centered around Zinnia, a new character the player is given a short glimpse of twice in the main storyline and will likely forget about by the time post-game rolls around. The game really expects you to like her though, despite the fact that she's incredibly impulsive and all she does throughout the storyline is harass you and other characters. Her ultimate goal is to summon Rayquaza to destroy a meteor threatening to destroy Hoenn, but her plans for doing so, including summoning Primal Gradon or Kyogre and stealing enough keystones to summon Rayquaza, are all riddled with holes and if they fail, would doom Hoenn anyway. In the end, she can't even control Rayquaza after summoning it, meaning if you weren't there, Hoenn would still be doomed with no recourse. Plot failings aside, the journey through the Delta episode is a painful slog. You're required to go back and forth between a handful of areas, occasionally being interrupted by a fight against a grunt well below your level, or two, or three. The course of the story takes you through places you might not have explored before, but really this isn't challenging or stimulating. 
It's just a waste of time that could be better spent on building up Zinnia as a character instead of the lackluster exposition we're given at the end. The ending of the Delta episode is admittedly fantastic, but the rest is so painfully bad I could never recommend sitting through it. Never mind the fact that your reward for sitting through the whole thing is not the Battle Frontier, but the Battle Maison copied directly from X and Y with no changes. Overall, Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire aren't bad, but they feel half-hearted in a lot of respects, with watered-down areas and removals instead of additions. The Delta episode feels like an attempt to give nods to Emerald without understanding what fans truly enjoyed about it, and what fans enjoyed about Emerald was certainly more than fighting Team Magma at the Space Center. Whereas Fire Red and Heart Gold are substantial improvements to the games they're based on, Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire fail to be a clear improvement on the first Ruby and Sapphire improvement. And so we arrive at the most recent remakes, Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee, remakes of Pokemon Yellow released 20 years later for the Nintendo Switch. Of all the Pokemon remakes, Let's Go feels the most regressive of them all. These are Generation 7 games, yet they remove held items, abilities, weather, breeding, the day and night cycle, and every Pokémon past the original 151. The physical special split, new types, and the friendship mechanics are still included, but those are glaring omissions that simplify the game to an unfortunate degree. This is accompanied by a sweeping change meant to capture the Pokémon Go audience the games are named after. Wild Pokémon are no longer fought, and instead you play a catching minigame. Some encounters, notably legendary Pokémon, are still fought, but gone is the careful tug-of-war from every game prior and in are awkward and often finicky motion controls that restrict you to a strange single Joy-Con setup. This new system highly encourages you to catch Pokémon. You get much more experience from catching Pokémon than you do from trainer battles, and combine that with the fact that trainer battles don't offer you much experience or money, and it often feels like a waste of time to battle trainers in the first place. Not that battling trainers is much of a challenge. Many of this game's mechanics give the player a huge advantage over their opponents. Effort values are gone, replaced with awakening values, straight-up stat boosts that function more similarly to stat experience but go well beyond the amount of boosts these systems can give you, capping out at a whopping 200 additional points per stat. The player isn't forced to interact with this system, but will be forced to interact with the friendship system being interwoven with Generation 6 and 7's affection mechanics. Through no interaction of their own, the bonuses of affection such as surviving a fatal blow, increased critical hit chance, and shrugging off a status condition are granted simply by walking around. These games are incredibly easy to break without even trying to do so, and major boss battles being toned down doesn't help either. This isn't even taking into account the new multiplayer mode, which turns battles into two-on-ones you're almost guaranteed to win. The storyline has also been altered. Instead of the original plotline, you're a new character with a new rival, Trace, who follows in the footsteps of more recent rivals in the series by being a friend to the player and actively helping them instead of hindering their progress. Blue even makes appearances throughout the game, with his attitude severely toned down, and there's more of a focus on the Team Rocket plot this time around. You're more integral to the plot than in the original titles, but to what end? Involving the player so heavily in the plot and fleshing out so many little things that really didn't need to be fleshed out leaves little room for the player to infer information based on the details they have been given, which was the real strength of the narrative of Generation 1. On top of this, there are no additional areas, only removals. The Safari Zone has been replaced with Go Park, where you can transfer in Pokémon from Pokémon Go, and Cerulean Cave has been dumped down a bit with the maze inside completely removed. In terms of post-game, the only additions are battles against Red, Blue, and Green, and there are lackluster battles against Master Trainers that are one-on-one -on -one matches where the player and AI both use the same Pokémon, but these are either one and done or meant to force the player into grinding for hours on end. Overworld Pokémon, while a major change and a much requested one at that, are a mixed bag. It's admittedly very nice to not have to go through random encounters to get Pokémon you want, but you'll still be waiting around doing nothing if you want to catch a rare spawn. 
Pokémon in the overworld also don't feel natural. They don't interact with one another or with nearby NPCs, only with the player on very infrequent occasions. And especially since so many tend to appear at once, they don't feel like the living creatures they're meant to be. It's not all negative. Overworld Pokémon are a net positive, the games are visually appealing, and your partner Pokémon is undeniably adorable. But these don't come close to making up for the fact that Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee are much more shallow games than Fire Red and Leaf Green 14 years prior, and at a much higher price tag. These games are supposedly targeting a much younger crowd, but young kids still deserve much better than this. And their parents deserve better than paying $60 for the privilege of playing a prettied up Game Boy game. The overall progression of the Pokémon remakes unfortunately demonstrates Game Freak's change in mentality as well. Game Freak is more concerned with creating a game made more to be a one-and-done experience than something to come back to like these games used to be designed around. After two remakes that are near-universal improvements over the original titles, it's disappointing that the most recent two settle for good enough or worse. I suppose it shouldn't come as a total surprise. It falls in line with how the main series has progressed up to this point, but it's nonetheless disappointing, and despite having a solid basis, I can't help but find myself worried that the upcoming remakes will, at best, follow in the footsteps of Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, and create something that doesn't go beyond the best versions of the original, but merely polishes up the base and calls it a day. And with that, I've tackled every mainline Pokémon game. Hard to believe, but I'm glad I accomplished what I originally set out to do, and I hope I've entertained and informed at least some of you along the way. If you've made it this far, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, I would appreciate it if you could leave a like and or comment down below. And if you want to see more of these long form analysis videos in the future, please consider subscribing. Until next time, I'm Forma, and those are my thoughts.